been in Calais 15 days now, sleeping rough. There was a place everybody called the jungle, but it's been destroyed, so now we have nowhere to sleep, and no blankets, no tents, nothing. The French authorities give us nothing. They just want us to go away. Believe me, if you see how they deal with us, you don't think you'd endure it. There is a part in the motorway where some of us have to sleep. Six police cars came last night. There were about 35 of us there. And they were punching all of us. Tonight, I don't know where I'll sleep. Nobody knows. We were helping the migrants informally at first. Then three years ago, we decided to become an organization, partly to protect ourselves as individuals from the police making trouble for us by saying that we were dealing in human trafficking. This is how they scare people to try and prevent them from helping the migrants. In fact, one of our members, Mama Monique, was taken into custody just after we'd celebrated the first anniversary of our association. And this created a lot of talk in the media about the plight of destitute migrants here and the French law that makes it illegal to offer help to them. Under this law, facilitating or trying to facilitate entry, movement or irregular stay of a foreigner in France, well, you can currently be sent to prison for up to five years. I've tried to cross the channel five times, hiding under lorries at Calais Ferry Port. We make ourselves very small. We don't breathe. Sometimes they ask us to put a plastic bag over our heads because the border guards, they can check for carbon dioxide. My family paid $14,000 for me to be smuggled to England. Well, I haven't really slept in a year, always keeping an eye on me at night. Forty of us left Afghanistan. Only three of us are here now. I want to go to England, not France. Ten times I've tried so far, sometimes uh, inside the truck, uh, sometimes under the truck. Last night I tried when the truck was getting petrol, and uh, last week I tried, but the truck went to Belgium. But still, I'll try. I'm 13, and I'm here in Calais with my two cousins, aged 10 and 11. We're alone here, and we have travelled alone from Afghanistan to Calais. It's been bad there. You know, there's no electricity, it's nothing like here. We paid smugglers to take us to England, 3,000 euros each. We went from Afghanistan to Iran, then to Turkey, and then to Greece. The journey was very dangerous. One time we got to a mountain, the smugglers just left us there, because they thought the police might come. I don't know much about England, only uh, cricket, bird and tea, <laughs> and that it's safe. I know that in England there are humans and animals. In Afghanistan we are all the same. Humans are animals, but in Calais, we are less than animals. I'm Sonia Linton, by the way, and I created the script, and I went to meet uh, the people whose stories you've just heard. And you can imagine uh, what a remarkable, and actually, deeply disturbing experience it was to meet some of these people, not least because of the context in which I was meeting them. Um, I was meeting largely young men and boys, only in the camp where there were Eritreans, which uh, Lily is going to tell you about, and also in the Vietnamese camp where there were any women. Um, and it was very distressing because they were so deeply distressed. I have interviewed asylum seekers in Britain but then, despite the very traumatic stories, I knew they had a roof over their head. But um, I knew that when I, after I'd spoken to these people, they did not know where they were going to sleep that night. It was going to be raining. They were going to be moved on constantly by the police. Um, and they were very young, as I just said. One of the things that struck me about the, um, the St. Gat Centre when we were there was one of the colleagues with me was from Wales. And she was saying to people, OK, I'm from Wales, and they were going, where's that? heard of England, but Wales. So we got taken to the map of the world to try and point out where Wales was. And when you looked at it, the UK had basically been rubbed away on that map because so many people had pointed to it saying, that's where we're going. And you know that was the only part of the map that was like that, where people were really determined to go. And of course, we know what happened to the Sandgap Centre. 
that was somewhere where you could have showers, you could have a meal, you could play football, you could sleep. Um, somewhere that at least began to treat people with a degree of dignity, and of course it was closed down because in that old phrase, it was a pull factor, and therefore that was bringing people to the area. Well, I think what we can see is that we may have closed, you know, Sangat may have closed, but people are still in the area. All of those sort of um, pieces of legislation have had a real evaluation from the Commission, from UNHCR, um, to look at how are they being implemented if they're being implemented properly. It's damn obvious that no, they're not. What you can also hear from tonight's um, performance, which I mean, I supply as usual way is very strong and I think very moving and demonstrates some of the complexities, is that even on things which are not part, if you like, of the European system, the way the police treat individuals, the way that governments decide to treat people who are operating, I suppose we would now have to say, as part of the big society in a voluntary way, you know, in a charitable way that embraces, you know, the failures of the state, as we heard very, very clearly. Um, all of that sort of oppression to even stop individuals behaving in a decent way is not part of legislation. It's part of how people choose to practice when they think they can get away with it.